So while everyone's filtering back in, earlier James had plugged uh, what uh, PSEC, the platform uh, security uh, conference that we had a couple months ago. Uh, if anyone's interested, the materials are starting to get posted online. And if you're looking for it, you're looking for platformsecuritysummit.com. So just a little uh, plug there. So um, thanks everyone for coming back from your break. I know the, uh, the, the cookies and everything back there must be uh, really distracting, but hopefully I'll lure you back to your seat. Uh, and uh, with this awesome talk about the TPM2 software stack, or TSS2. Um, so uh, I work for Intel. My name is Philip Tricka. You can see it up there on the slide next to my email. If you need to get in touch, don't hesitate. Uh, you can find me through a number of different mechanisms. Got my GitHub link up there and everything. So this is the, the TSS2 as defined by the Trusted Computing Group. Uh, Intel uh, works in TCG quite a bit. Uh, myself, I've uh, inherited the throne to the, uh, uh, the, the software stack working group and uh, we are, are hard at work standardizing uh, those APIs and, and implementing them as well. So there are, kind of, there are three major thrusts to this talk, um, and one of them is not background. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the TPM, interesting things that people can do with it. I'm assuming that there is a fairly kind of basic knowledge, uh, at least for what it is and what it does. Um, I'll do one slide on background, and it'll be pretty quick. The rest of it is gonna be dedicated to uh, the design of the, the software stack, the actual uh, uh, collaborative process a little bit, talking about what we've done in the TCG. Uh, we'll do a component breakdown, so there'll be a lot of boxes and arrows to, to show you which components uh, talk to which, and uh, we'll, we'll do a really good uh, breakdown of the, the plumbing there. And the second part of this, we'll talk about the open source uh, work that we're doing uh, with the stack and how we're doing the development. So. I'm sure that it'll be hard to disagree with a, a statement where someone would say that in order to design an API, you need to be informed by experimentation. You have to try to use the API to see that it actually does what you expect it to do. And that's very much a part of this process. So we've been doing a ton of work about, uh, with um, uh, community building, promoting adoption, and trying to make this less painful than interacting with the TPM usually is. And then the, uh, the, last, the last bit of the talk focuses on, on use cases and examples. And one of the biggest problems that we have is that the TPM is very complicated in a lot of cases. And so writing code to use it is kind of difficult. And so if we're forcing people into a situation where they have to both you know, build all the software, get it installed, and then suddenly write however many lines of C code to do something meaningful, all while trying to figure out what something meaningful is, um, that's really a heavy lift for a lot of people. And the, the learning curve there is just too much, I would say. And so what we, what we do is we have a bunch of projects that are out there that'll help people uh, just build some simple uh, cases where they can do something uh, useful and not have to invest you know, weeks or months in, to get there. Uh, so really it's kind of about instant gratification. And we'll also talk a bit about the, uh, the flexibility that's been built into the stack. And I, I've actually worked on a use case specifically to, to, to exercise this a bit. So we, we, we're showing that the stack has various components and that it can be used in, in a bunch of different use cases. And so background, really quick, if you wanna get up to speed on the TPM, you can go out and read the spec if you like. It's pretty heavyweight. I would instead recommend that you find some materials uh, or Ariel Siegel's most recent book. I'm a big fan of, of the writing, it's very approachable. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about where you should start out. Um, but really, when you're, when you're looking at the evolution of the TPM from 1.2 to 2.0, the use cases are largely unchanged. This thing is still very good for protecting encryption keys, or signing keys while they're in use, so really cryptographic key protection, uh, and the notion of this root of trust for storage, whoops, there goes that, and uh, reporting. Uh, the, the TPM 1.2, and the 2.0 didn't really change that much as far as that use case is concerned. However, the actual implementation has changed fairly drastically. Algorithm support, uh, having algorithm agility, which means that you can start implementing new algorithms in the TPM, and the structure of the command and response buffers is resilient to this. So there's a lot of you know, size and then you know, some field value. Um, also, the 2.0 has added uh, some interesting stuff around the protection uh, for the communication path between the application and the TPM itself. So there are uh, protected and, and encrypted sessions, so integrity protected and encrypted sessions, which is particularly interesting. So that's it for background. The rest of this is just gonna go straight into the software stack, and we'll talk first about the design. So I have never actually sat down and written an API that was used by a large number of people. So the first thing I did when this project was kind of left by, by the group that was running it, and I ended up kind of scooping up and, and carrying it forward, the first thing I did was just jump on my favorite search engine and type in how to design an API. Um, 
Then I went back and added how to design a good API. And I found a, uh, a, a talk uh, that's up on, on um, YouTube. I think it's Joshua Block, is, and I'm sure I'm ruining his last name. Uh, but this is a guy from Google who's been designing APIs probably since before I was born. And the thing that I took mostly out of his talk is that uh, use cases are where this, this whole thing comes from. If you don't know how the API or how you want the API to be used, it will probably never be used uh, for anything useful. So all of this is driven by use cases. And from these use cases came this notion of a layered design. Intel, working for Intel, they, we, we write a lot of firmware. We write a lot of stuff that gets very close to the hardware. And so sometimes, thinking of UEFI, you may not have the environment available to you when you're writing this code uh, that would support you know, what we think of as a regular user space process. So we showed up with a requirement just that we needed to be able to use this stuff from a firmware environment. Now, obviously, we want it to be able to be used from a normal Ring 3 environment. And so we end up kind of having to layer these things. Uh, one of the more useful things that we did in this also is separating the transport layer from the API itself. It's, uh, that was a, a really hard part for me working with uh, the, the 1.2 TSS trousers, um, is that there was a very tight coupling between uh, the daemon portion and you know, the user space application. Um, this made it really hard to do things in early boot code if you wanted to do something without having to start the daemon or even earlier than that if you may not have even been able to. Uh, so I think of that as a really, really big improvement. Um, also, synchronous and asynchronous, we were wanting to be able to support event-driven programming. If you have a synchronous API, you can support an event-driven uh, framework that would use something like uh, a, a, th a worker thread model. Uh, but there are also plenty of other uh, event-driven programming uh, libraries out there that use poll. And so we wanted to be able to use uh, a poll interface to this as well so that we could support you know, more than just one event-driven programming. And uh, let's see, the other thing is that we don't want to abstract away all of the details of the TPM. We want to be able to have very fine control, uh, but also at the same time, when you don't need the, that very fine control and all those details, you'll get some sane defaults uh, from the actual, uh, from the stack. And sometimes those defaults are chosen by the TCG. They come out of the working group. We pick constants, uh, si various sizes for, for structures uh, that are kind of formalized in the, uh, the implementation. Um, but also there's uh, the notion of, you know, Linux distro may have their TPM or their infrastructure set up differently and they may want a different set of transport. And so there's a way for, for the libraries at build time to be able to override some of these defaults. So, the layered approach, we'll kind of jump into that on the next slide, but uh, the, the lowest layers, just think of getting low and closer to the hardware. This is intended for the use of by expert applications uh, or things that are in constrained environments, so microcontrollers, you know, really, really embedded stuff. Uh, and so that means just a minimal set of dependencies. If you're gonna statically link a lot of this stuff together, um, you don't want to have to statically link in tons of things, and even worse, if those APIs required access to the file system, that would be particularly problematic. Uh, and the upper layers are providing some convenience functions. And again, more features means more dependencies. So this, this diagram comes pretty much straight, straight from the spec, and it's you know, the kind of layer cake uh, that, should, that we kind of build up from the bottom. The, uh, the two lowest layers in this, so I guess the lowest one, the device driver layer, really doesn't have a standard interface. This really depends on the, the, the operating system you're, you're working on or the environment you're in. You're in UEFI, you get access to the tree protocol, which I guess has been renamed to the TCG2 protocol now that it's been standardized, uh, even though it didn't change at all. Um, there's also the device driver layer from Linux that has a device node, uh, but also if you're on Windows, you get TBS. And I'm sure you know the, there's a number of other uh, interfaces that may get written and exposed there. So the device driver really has a non-standard interface, and this is again why we, we wanted to separate the transmission layer. The device driver may be packaged or may not be packaged with the access broker and resource management daemon, uh, or that component, I should say. Uh, and so in 1.2, that was a user space process. In Windows, it's built into the, the kernel driver. And on Linux, we're starting to move closer and closer to having that full set of functionality uh, in the kernel as well. Right now, the implementation of the resource manager in the kernel is very, very primitive. Uh, we still have and maintain a, uh, a daemon that does this in user space, and we're slowly migrating features in as, as that makes sense. And so as you're, we're, the, the glue that kind of 
pull, holds together these layers is this TPM command transmission interface. If your resource manager is in the kernel, you really don't have to worry about too much there. You just kind of put the, the TCTI layer on top of that and it plums everything into the upper layer APIs. If your resource management is being done by a user space process, then you'll have a layer that you know, sits underneath it that is the TCTI and it'll expose a front end and you'll have another one on top of that. So you could really just stack these things at end nauseum, but I don't recommend you try that. The top layer here is really the stuff that programmers care about. This is the, the APIs that programs interact with generally. And so working from left to right, the system API here is our lowest layer. It is a extremely thin layer on top of the actual TPM commands. Every command is exposed. There is a synchronous and an asynchronous version. And uh, the, the, the system API does very little more than just turning C structures into a TPM command byte stream sending it out using a TCTI that it's been configured to use uh, and getting back the response, turning it back into C structures, handing them to the caller. Extremely simple, but extremely powerful. Uh, moving next step to the right, uh, enhanced system API is really what it sounds like. It just enhances the system API and provides uh, some really nice convenience functions, which are really just automating the crypto operations uh, for HMAC and encrypted sessions. It will also do dynamic loading of the TCTI modules, and this is where some of that configuration comes from. If you're on a properly configured system and your distro has set up the packaging right, they can choose the default TCTI that makes sense for their system, and you won't even need to tell ESYS that, uh, uh, that, that, um, that, that which TCTI you want. You can just give it a null pointer and it'll pick the right one for you. Still, you can override it by initializing one yourself and passing it in if you need to. The box here in gray is the one that still isn't done. The feature API is meant to abstract the TPM even further, but that stuff is still very much under consideration. So now that we've kind of broken down the layer cake, let's actually look at what these things look like when we put them into an application. Just like what I was saying on the last slide, the system API transforms C types into TPM command buffers, one-to-one -one mapping with the commands, and it's suitable for highly embedded applications. We don't recommend you use this from you know, general user space apps. Uh, but for the, quite a while, this was all that we had, and so we were actually doing that. And I can tell you it's very painful to use in that regard. Uh, internally, this uses another utility library that we've defined, which is really just where we, we do this type marshalling. For every type that exists in uh, the TPM spec, there is a, a corresponding marshal and unmarshal function in this library. And so the system API really just does a little bit of state tracking internally and calls out to the, the marshalling library. Then everything gets pumped out through the, the transmission interface in the bottom, and it gets sent over whatever IPC mechanism uh, down to a device driver, and you know, you'll get your response back. So we have a bunch of these TCTI modules that we can actually kind of remix uh, very dynamically. So you don't even need to recompile the application in order to, to change them. And they'll allow you to talk to either you know, the device driver. We have one for talking to the Microsoft simulator code so you can run the TPM in like a user space process. Excellent for debugging, which you, know, you end up having to do a lot of when you try and use this <laughs> stuff. Uh, and one to talk to TBS. We actually have one that'll, that'll work on Windows. So you can, you can use the, uh, the stack on Windows as well. Adding the enhanced system API layer on top of this, uh, we add some of these additional dependencies and, and really this comes in the form of the crypto libraries. Um, so the current implementation, we support libgcrypt and OpenSSL and I, you know, adding, adding additional libraries isn't a, an enormous burden. There are uh, uh, some well-defined interfaces um, inside of the, the, the eSys that can be used to, to add additional crypto layers. This is really what you want to do if you're writing a general user space C application right now. This is what we're recommending to folks. And we've actually just added this fairly recently. It was a, a really big development for us. Now there's nothing that strictly says that you need to build these in this way. You could have a completely separate system API uh, library and you could re-implement eSys entirely without using it. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. We, we, we use ours internally and it's, uh, it's a great way to get you know, just better test coverage. You just have fewer code paths. So lastly, just before we're, we're done with the actual architecture side of it, the resource management is uh, um, really interesting and unfortunately complex. Um, TPMs are, are really small, really inexpensive, and you know, they have RAM on the order of a few kilobytes. Um, you 
the, the TPM itself has no notion of users. It doesn't know where the commands are coming from. And so the resource management daemon component or the, the component that may be in your kernel uh, really just is there to make sure that the, the objects that you have previously loaded, loaded and that you are going to use again get loaded for you. Uh, the resource management uh, component uses just three uh, TPM commands to do this. Um, and really the, the, the management component comes down to saving and loading context on behalf of the caller. Um, this gets you a certain kind of isolation from other users of the TPM. The resource manager loads your contacts for you. When you're done, it unloads them, then executes another command, and your objects will not be available to that, that command because it may not be coming from you. And the resource management component is usually the part that understands the, the connection, uh, the client connection, so it knows the difference between you know, where the commands are coming from. And like I said earlier, we're starting to move this functionality to the kernel de device driver, not as quickly as I would like, but it's, uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot of work to go around, really. So um, the software stack from the open source implementation side, this is uh, the community uh, that we're trying to build, the adoption that we're seeing, uh, and, you know, some of our, our success stories along the way. So when I inherited this project, God, it was almost three years ago now, um, I was definitely not the first person working on it. It was a prototype developed uh, by a team that came before me who all magically decided to leave at the same time. Uh, and so the whole thing just got kind of dropped on the floor. And to my, to my boss's credit, you know, I, I, no one said, hey, Phil, go clean that up. They said, Are you sure you want to clean that up? And this stuff seems pretty important to me. I mean, I've, been, I've written uh, systems that use TPM 1.2. Uh, it has some really interesting properties, and I think you know, that the open source community needs to have this stuff available, and it should be done right, because it's kind of plumbing, and you just want your plumbing to work. Um, but when I picked it up, I had to do this you know, stability, reliability, how do I get this thing into a shape so I can actually support it? What happens if someone submits a bug and I just, I, I don't even know what that part of the system does. So it all, you know, the, the initial year of this was just triage. Pay down technical debt, identify a code that's a liability that I know I can't support, and come up with a way to, to, to remediate that whole thing. And that really gets down to making it debuggable. Like, how, you know, if someone sends me a bug report, if I don't, if I've never worked in that part of the system, how do I at least get meaningful information out of it to find out where it's coming from? A lot of this got down to write the right tools for the tasks. When I inherited this, the build system was one make file that was handwritten. Um, that doesn't make this particularly easy for operating systems or uh, uh, distros to actually package the, the stuff. So finding, you know, a real build system. CMake uh, would have done the task just fine. I chose auto tools. They both have their problems. They both have their strengths. Um, and some of the things I just kind of cut off. This, the, my predecessor that was leading the development effort was very much a Windows developer, even though this was really designed to be used on Linux, and so he did all of his work in Visual Studio. And the first thing I did when I came in was just look at the Visual Studio files, and I said, I haven't looked at this in 15 years, um, and I deleted them. It didn't make me particularly popular, um, because it turns out there was a group in Intel that was actually using that stuff. Um, <laughs> but that was how I found out, and uh, you know, and then that's how we got our remediation strategy together, right? I mean, they weren't even using the latest version anyways, so, you know, I got to do the, when are you gonna update? When do I have to have this ready? And so I went back and learned a lot about Visual Studio, learned about building DLLs, uh, learned about doing continuous integration on Windows, uh, and, you know, we, we, we've just kind of moved it forward. And now our, our, our Windows support is actually a lot better than it used to be. Some things just had to go entirely, though. Uh, the original resource management daemon was an absolute disaster. Um, and I just deleted it and started over. And it was so bad that actually the people that were using it inside of Intel, they had some problems using it, and it was for a high priority project, and they threw me on a plane and sent me to Poland for a week to try to help them figure it out. And after that, we worked through their issue, I went back and deleted it and started writing over. All of this boils down to just trying to build a healthy open source project. Something that looks healthy from the outside when people are looking at it so that they'll say, yes, I actually think I should use that. I'm willing to build something that depends on that and I'm, not, and I, and I'm pretty sure that it'll still be there when I, when I need it, that it'll get updated. Um, success metrics like who's, you know, adoption, right? Your end user in a lot of these things really isn't at the end user who's sitting at the keyboard. They don't compile source themselves a lot of the time. The, distro packager ends up becoming really your target audience. You want the distro packager to be happy and to make packaging this stuff for the distro very easy. 
how you communicate with them about changes. Semantic versioning is very important. You know, when you're actually breaking API, making it very clear in your version numbers. Testing was super important. The test code that I inherited was a 9,000 line C application. One application with tests that you know, later tests would have, uh, would depend on state that was set up by previous tests. So yanking all of that out, decomposing that, putting it into a test harness that's built into the build system, separating unit and integration tests. There really weren't unit tests to begin with, but I'm now a big fan of CMocha, which is really, really cool. Uh, integration tests that actually get their own version of the TPM, a new instance of the simulator when you're running the test, that have the, a test harness that will set that up for you and tear it down that will get you meaningful logging information when something breaks, and then tying it all together with a CI loop. Um, and, and this was really just you know, a, a one person task for a while because I wasn't just trying to attract users, I was trying to attract people inside of the company, inside of Intel and outside of Intel as well to contribute. I needed people to help me do this because I couldn't do it alone. And so we've got all of our, you know, all of our Travis CI coveralls, so we're, test, we're getting metrics for our code coverage. Our goal is to have everything above 80%, and I think we've only got one part of the project that's below that now, setting up uh, static analysis so that Coverity is run on these things, and we use scan build as well. So we use two different static analysis suites. So now everything is up on GitHub. We actually have an organization for the project that's separate from the Intel real estate, and that's because we've gotten some very significant contributions from the outside. And it just makes sense that, you know, that when we've gotten uh, a large contribution like the ESIS layer. We, we've been working with folks inside of the TCG and you know, our friends at, uh, at Fraunhofer, um, they actually had a stack that was built completely separately and was just not open source. And when they saw that the project had come along, they looked and they said, you're missing ESIS, that's the only thing you're missing. And you know, we worked out a, a, an agreement and you know, we've had some really good chemistry uh, with the, the developers over there and they actually took their ESIS, lopped off the lower parts and open sourced the, the higher level API uh, and it rebased it on top of our, our kind of lower parts of the stack. And that's really, I mean, that's really the thing that made, it, uh, made this as successful as it is because the system API alone is not, is not sufficient. We need ESIS and that's, that's been a big part of this. So we've got a mailing list. Got a repo here with the, the core libraries. That includes the programming APIs and some of the transport layers. Uh, we have a set of command line tools that I'll talk about later on. Uh, we have uh, an open SSL engine now that's out um, that I learned a lot about <laughs> in preparing for this talk. Uh, and we have a, a resource management daemon, like I was saying. So we've, had, uh, we've got maintainers now that aren't just from Intel, so I've managed to get a bunch of folks from Intel's open source uh, uh, team, OTC, uh, to come on board and help. Uh, and we've also gotten folks from Fraunhofer SIT, uh, and we have a maintainer from, from Red Hat as well. So uh, we've done, I think we've come you know, a, a really long way in the last, uh, last two years. Finally, we've also gotten some really large contributions from, from the folks at Infineon. Uh, Peter Hugh is a previous maintainer for the, the kernel driver. Um, he was the, the one who helped me get Coverity set up and he was really the one that put the spurs to me to make sure it happened. Um, and we've gotten, you know, Facebook was actually one of our first really big name users and they did a, a pretty significant deployment on top of this stuff. And we've gotten patches from Alibaba, Red Hat, GE, Suze, Debian. Um, so we, we've, we've gotten some really good uh, community involvement that I'm, I'm really proud of. Also, we have a bunch of new projects that are in the work. Uh, we've got a PKCS 11 module that's uh, getting ready to be open sourced. Um, I've written a, a transport layer uh, or a transport driver for, that can be used in UEFI, so I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, we have a set of patches that uh, Fraunhofer is, is putting up for a crypt uh, setup integration. Uh, and we have a, a response code decoder, basically. That was one of the first things that I ended up writing when I came on board. But as folks from OTC came on, uh, Bill Roberts, uh, you know, looked at the, the tool and was like, that's super useful, but we should probably just have this be a library so we don't, people don't even have to put, you know, these raw binary RCs into the tool. So uh, we're working on actually standardizing that API right now. So I've already kind of bragged about, you know, names. I'm up here uh, dropping names like crazy, but I'm gonna keep doing it. Um, packaging for, for distros is a really big deal for us. Uh, I can't tell you how many, you know, oh, I ran make and nothing happened questions we've gotten from, from kind of users on the mailing list. And being able to tell them just to download it through your package manager is really, really important. Uh, we've done, geez, maybe back in June, uh, I did our, our 2.0 release uh, that should make it into RHEL 8. Uh, unfortunately, we missed the, the, uh, the SUSE um, uh, enterprise deadline for 15, so we're gonna be a little bit behind on that. It's just, you know, you can't win them all, I guess. 
Uh, and 2.0 for us is a, a really big API compliant release. Um, when, I, when I took the project over, I had just stamped a 1.0 release like immediately, and I'm like, this is apparently our API right now. And going through that and figuring out where it lines up with the spec, we had some deviations. Uh, and changing you know, your API and your ABI, you don't do that lightly. So we uh, spent about a year uh, working on the 2.0 release, um, and it's a lot of management when you think about having a, a, you know, a release branch around and not being able to release from, from your master branch for a long time. So we're very, very happy to have the 2.0 release out now, and hopefully, you know, unless the spec changes, 2.0 will be, you know, our, or 2 will be our major version number, hopefully, for a very long time. Also, uh, Red Hat is doing uh, some integration with their Clevis system. It's not something I'm entirely familiar with, but as I understand it, and there's a link here uh, that, that should tell you more about it, uh, but this is a, a pretty interesting system now that's using the TPM for some, some key management and protection. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think that's hopefully the direction things will be going. In the future, our, our, our next goal is now that we have these APIs that are stable, we now want to start integrating this stuff into the core uh, platform you know, of Linux so that we can actually benefit from having the TPMs and using the TPMs that are on all of our systems. StrongSwan has been one of, our, uh, one of the, the TPMs, probably most prominent users in the Linux community. They had a 2.0 or rather a 1.2 uh, implementation that, used, uh, that they used for, for doing uh, protecting client side keys. They've updated that using our, our TSS as well and, and they've even kept up to pace with our, our 2.0 release. So StrongSwan is, is, is a really uh, one of the early adopters and, and they're doing really good stuff. Uh, myself personally, I have a, a, a soft spot for open embedded, and so I maintain uh, a layer that has all the recipes for this stuff. I haven't updated it to 2.0 yet, uh, but I pretty much get an email a day from random places of the internet asking me what I'm going to, so uh, I think that's probably going to happen sooner than later. And really, I think the, the right way to handle you know, open embedded and, and, and this going forward is to get rid of the, you know, a separate layer where those recipes live, and, and those need to go as far upstream as they can. Uh, I think that's probably going to be a pet project of mine for the fall. If anyone's interested in that, by the way, I would love some help. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, changelog for a 2.0 release, right? We've got compatibility with the TPM 2.138 uh, spec. We've got a couple extra commands for the 146 uh, or from the, the draft 146 spec, which is specifically the uh, attached component commands. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, feature that's been added to the TPM uh, spec really recently, and uh, I think it has a lot of potential. So if you're interested in, in some new and wild things that the TPM might be able to do for you, uh, the AC commands are, are something you may want to take a look at. So we've added a bunch of libraries. So the type marshaling library is new. Uh, again, the ESYS implementation we got uh, via Fraunhofer and uh, our collaboration with uh, Infineon, which you know, is, is, again, another reason why I think this, this, uh, this project is viable for the future. Uh, again, we've added, uh, I've added back all that support for Windows. Uh, we have a TCTI that'll talk to TBS. There were no required changes in any of the other libraries. Uh, we did, <laughs> I did, and I guess I should say, I learned in the process of doing this that the Visual Studio compiler isn't really C99 compliant. Um, whoops. Uh, so once I figured out that that's where all my errors were coming from, uh, I then figured out how to get Clang working on Visual, on Visual Studio, and the world is a much better place for it. So uh, if you do stuff in Visual Studio, I highly recommend figuring out how to get Clang plugged into that. Uh, and again, yeah, using AppVair for, for CI. So we do CI builds uh, for Windows. We do those on, uh, on, on AppVair. Uh, I have not yet gone through AppVair or uh, Visual Studio to figure out how to, to set up our, our test infrastructure. So we basically just build for Windows, but we don't have our test harness running on Windows yet. Okay, so the, the final uh, push for this talk are our use cases, and I got just about 10 minutes left, so. Uh, that should be sufficient. Let's find out. The, um, right, so when people show up, there's this, to the project, there's this kind of path they take, right? They try to build it, it fails. We have to explain to them how, how uh, auto tools work, how to install the dependencies. They get it built, they get it installed, and then they kind of just say, you know, what do I do with this thing now? Um, they may know what it's good for, but they don't necessarily know how to program to make it do something useful. And so in, to, in, in our efforts to reduce the learning curve, we want to sh have people be able to do something without writing a pile of code in order to do it. And so if, we're, if, if we can communicate to them what the TPMs are good for, and again, there's a lot of good information out, out there about it, data protection for, for 
keys, uh, also data protection for you know whatever you want to stick into the NV storage. And we've seen a couple talks that talk about that. Uh, and then you know attestation is interesting, but you're not going to get someone who you know. Unfortunately, people want to do this. They build it, they install it, and they're like, now I'm going to write my attestation service. And then you know they usually just disappear because it's a huge undertaking. So really, what we want is to start have people start out just doing basic crypto operations. How do I get the TPM to create a key for me? How do I load a key? How do I get it to sign something? How do I verify that signature? And to do that, maybe even without writing code. So this is where the TPM tools project comes in. Uh, again, this was uh, a part of what I inherited. Uh, and it's changed significantly over time. So OTC has taken this over. It started out as almost a, a clone of the TPM 1.2 tools, which unfortunately had a lot of TPM 1.2 isms formalized in those tools. And so we've kind of been going through and stripping that out and making a uh, almost like a one-to-one -one mapping to TPM 2 commands. So you can literally see when you're running the command line tools, it does this thing. If you dial up logging, you'll get to see the full command buffer that, that gets sent out of the, the TCTI and the response that comes back. And we can kind of use this as a teaching tool. So this is literally the steps that you do to create a primary key in the, uh, the, the storage hierarchy, the, then create a subkey that you can then use to do specific things. We then load the subkey that we created we can calculate a hash of a document or some kind of message using OpenSSL. So we just kind of create a hash locally. We then use the TPM to sign that hash with the key that we just created. We have a little format option you can see here that will output it in a dir format. So it's a format that you know a lot of other tools will recognize and use. We then extract the public portion of our uh, of our um, or sorry that is extracting the public portion, making sure it's in dir format. Then we can use OpenSSL to verify that hash or the signature on that hash and make sure that it meets the, the, the document or the message that we actually calculated from. That's um, kind of the one of the, when you actually look at how systems like StrongSwan use this, they, this is pretty much everything that's happening. You got a key, you're protecting it to the TPM, you're going to negotiate a, uh, a TLS session, so you're gonna, uh, rather I should say an IPsec session. Uh, so as part of that exchange, you've gotta prove who you are and you usually sign something with a, a private key and send it back. That's exactly what this is, but just on a command line locally. Um, now, you'll notice there aren't very many options that I'm using here, so we're using a lot of default options. I think it creates a SHA-1 key, which you may not want to do. SHA-256 may make more sense. You want to make restrictions on this so that you actually have to be author or authenticate yourself to prove that you're authorized to load and use a key. Uh, none of that is being done here. Null password, creating a key. Anyone, if they have this, this blob of the key, they could load it again and use it and sign stuff with it. So this isn't particularly meaningful as far as providing some kind of security guarantee to you. However, it's mechanically the steps that you would go through in order to do a basic sign operation on the TPM and have it verified using a different tool. That's, uh, that's something I think we've been missing for a long time. And really, you know, you'll, you'll notice the bullet at the top there. This, this was a, um, a demo that got put together by a, a Facebook employee, Davide, and he presented this at FOSTEM in 2017. So if you wanna see really where we've come in pretty much just a year, uh, you can line this up next to what he had to do to make this work. And it's pretty stark. I mean, he has some commands where he's literally going through like a TPM, uh, the public key that the TPM dumps out, and like grabbing specific portions, sticking them together in a way that that turned into the dir format. So we're trying to pull this stuff internal and make it so it's you know it's part of our our, our system. And also, I guess I should say, we're trying to learn from the people that are using this. I mean, this guy at Facebook didn't do this because you know he was bored. He did this because he needed to, and it was something useful. So we're pulling it in and making it easier for him. An example using the OpenSSL engine is right here, and this is almost the exact same uh, demo as before. So we have a separate utility that is used to create the key because apparently you can't do that through the engine. And again, I didn't write this. I, I learned about this last week. Um, we then use the OpenSSL engine to output the, uh, uh, the, the public key in the PEM format. So now we're using OpenSSL for, to do this for us. We then use OpenSSL to hash the document. Doesn't require the, uh, the, the engine. We then sign the hash using the engine and verify the signature just using straight open SSL again. So there's a couple of the TPM commands that you saw in there where I'm creating a primary key, creating a sub key, uh, then I'm loading the key. All that gets done by the, uh, the, the open SSL engine for you and you don't have to really deal with, with that part of it. Um, which is, you know, it's nice. It's nice to not have to, to, to even understand or know what that, what that is. 
And finally, uh, I, I wanted to be able to show this because the, um, the use case for the system API is one, again, that's particularly interesting to Intel, but we never really had an implementation that w of this that we were, were showing off. And again, to come, you know, to come clean on my, on my previous kind of pontification about, uh, about API design, we said that this was the intended use case, but you know, really you gotta put your code where your mouth is and you know, get it out there so people can see it. And so I've started a, a new project that I just got open, approval to open source last week. Uh, and all it is is a, a, a TCTI layer that sits on top of the TCG2 protocol in UEFI and it enables, it enables the use of the system API. So instead of having what's only available through the, the TCG2 protocol, which basically boils down to a bunch of commands to query the protocol to figure out you know, the state of it, some stuff to manipulate PCR banks that no one will ever actually do if they're writing uh, you know, a UEFI application, uh, and then one command to just send a raw buffer that someone somewhere has already crafted. And so we use the system API to do that for us. And you can, you know, the, we, we've got an example application in there that just uh, builds uh, a simple UEFI executable that you can drop into a, a, a FAT32 uh, partition, load up the EFI shell, and run this command. And you can see the difference between what the get capability command in the TCG2 protocol shows you, which is information about the protocol, and what the get capability command from the TPM gets you, which is information about you know, the guts of the TPM. And so that stuff hasn't actually gotten brought into our, our main project yet because we're not exactly sure how it's gonna fit in there. A lot of this for me was just an exercise in learning the ridiculous things you have to do to build an EFI executable. And so our libraries right now and the way that build works, uh, we can't build the, the, the libraries in that way yet. So you know, we're not perfect, we've slipped up a little bit on our build hygiene and we're kind of forcing flags on users when they may not want to use them. So, uh, that's kind of on me to go clean up now that I've stumbled across it. So I think this could be really interesting. I mean, there were some talks earlier about firmware, people using the TPM in the firmware. Um, this isn't a model for doing that efficiently for sure because everything's just statically compiled into a single executable and if you build more than one executable, you'll have redundant code across them. Um, but you know, there's, I'm sure there's some give and take where this might actually be useful. So um, if anyone thinks that this might be something that they could, uh, could use in their day-to-day, their -day, I'm, I'm happy to chat about it. And that's, uh, that is it. So I've managed to come in under the 40 minute mark. So I, uh, I can handle a couple questions, I think. Oh, also um, uh, references. So some of the references from there as well. This is, uh, you know, take a, take a look. Well, that was easy, thanks. Oh no, oh, no. sorry, we got one. Oh no, we got two. <laughs> yeah, have you looked at trying to integrate the T your TSS2 library with a uh, commonly used uh, open source uh, crypto programs like say SSH uh, and OpenSSL? Right, so uh, James Bottomley has done that with the IBM TSS library, and to be honest, that's the only reason why I'm using the IBM TSS library. It sounds like I would much rather use this, um, but uh, well, you know, start. SSH integration is kind of cool. Right, so uh, on one of the previous slides, uh, there's, a, there's a handful of questions in there, but on one of the previous slides, uh, PKSES 11. That gets us a lot of free integration with things like OpenSS, or rather, uh, with SSH. So SSH, if you've got a PKCS 11 module, you can use that for your authentication. Um, we've we had someone build an open uh, a PKCS 11 module in the past, had a demo that did exactly that, but the code wasn't such that we were, were willing to open source it or support it. So we're rewriting that now. Um, the second part of that was, sorry, you gotta remind me now, there was one other part of that, for OpenSSL integration. So we have the engine. Um, I'd be interested to know what else uh, we're missing. Um, I'm not an OpenSSL expert. I did not write the engine. That was another thing that, that uh, Fraunhofer uh, contributed to the project. Um, so, you know, on the mailing list, uh, if you want to meet up afterwards, I'll take down a pile of notes and uh, um, uh, we'd love to have it be, you know, your TSS of choice. Um, two part question. So, the first one are there any good videos you'd recommend on boot integrity? Um, and firmware security. Sorry, uh, can you say that one more time? 
Uh, any videos you recommend? This is a leading question. Uh, yeah. On right. firmware so, security and boot integrity. <laughs> and then I have an actual question. <laughs> Thanks. So like I was saying, I plugged uh, the platform security conference earlier. Um, there were a lot of great talks there. But uh, you know, there were a lot of good ones about Linux boot. So we had Trummel Hudson there. Vincent Zimmer was there as well. And I think his talk is phenomenal. OK. And uh, <clears throat> you know, TPMs have had sometimes a bad rap in the Linux community. Do you have an opinion on why, uh, say, Google is doing things like shielded VMs without TPM? They have their own root of trust. Um, and then Windows System Guard is doing quite a bit of stuff uh, on trusted boot. So do you think the Linux community is going to follow these examples? Oh, well, I mean, they're, I was just going to say no, but uh, um, they're, they're examples. Uh, we can choose them as a model. We can see if they fit. It's nice to have people that have done the work you know, ahead of you so you can look at them and say, that worked, that worked, that didn't work. You know, it's all about the properties you want from the system. And I think that's really a question, you know, that I'd love to hear some of the folks in the distro community talking about. Um, Red Hat, how the Red Hats of the world intend to do something maybe like BitLocker-ish, I think is probably the first and easiest step. Anything, you know, that's more complicated than that might be useful too, but I start small, start simple. All right, well, thank you.